full-time position of a detective deputy. At this time, the chair would entertain a motion to recommend the board commissioner's approval to add a new full-time detective deputy position. No moved. Support. That motion is made by Smelker, supported by Gibson. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So what do we have here? Well, what we're asking for is creation of additional full-time position for of a deputy detective deputy. Can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. And the time frame would be basically for starting January 2022. Uh, amount requested would be $58,884.80. Uh, was allocated through the 301, it allocated $49,824. And 66 cents to various fringe benefits, which is not including the other part, which is on the back. Uh, estimated vehicle and uh, equipment cost would be approximately 38,000, with uh, $108,709.46, with the vehicle included 147,709.46. And based on the current the sheriff's office has two full-time detectives one detective sergeant and one detective deputy. The position maintains several responsibilities, including investigation of all aspects of major criminal investigations, internal investigations, background investigations, assisting and overseeing uniform division complaints and investigations, including major crimes such as homicide, rape, robbery, severe physical abuse of children, sexual abuse of child, and kidnapping and several uh, severe assaults. Uh, we also have increase in violence, including homicides, uh, severe physical and sexual assaults, increase of crimes related to uh, computer-based uh, sex offenses, CSAM, uh, sex extortion, obscenity, required additional hours to investigate or assist uniform division because of the uh, technical in nature. We have uh, on the other sheets, if we, you'll see if we're the criminal side with the 0900s down to the 3700s, which includes murder, homicide, CSE, robbery, felonious assault, arson, sex offenses, obscenity. Uh, from 2009, we were handled 63 complaints for that, and up to now, 2021 to present, we have handled 122 just for this year, including then uh, more of a, say, said, say non-criminal uh, 9,800 nines is the drug overdoses up to the 7,000s, which is a status offense for the runaways. Uh, 2009, we had 71, and to present, uh, in 2021, we've had 157. Thus, to, in order for our detectives to stay on top of everything, it's, it's very difficult because of the added uh, amount of complaints in each of these uh, major uh, scenes and crimes, uh, including with the homicides that we have as well as the other and thus um, detective sergeant Mackey's here also if you have any comp uh, questions for her as well as uh, uh, prosecutor chief prosecutor Julie knack for Pratt if you have any questions for her would you have, like to say anything I would if that's okay yes thank please you. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. My name is Julie Nackfor Pratt and I'm the prosecuting attorney here in Barry County. I am currently uh, in the beginning of my third term, so I've had a lot of experience uh, with the detectives here in Barry County and respect every one of them. In addition, I've had uh, 33 years of a career uh, involving criminal cases, criminal prosecution and criminal defense, so I know what goes into a criminal case. So I want to highlight a couple things. Um, when I first spoke to, uh, started speaking to people about this, what I'm seeing and what I think is most important is that our detectives at the Sheriff's Department, Jeanette Mackey and Jeremiah Kimball, work tirelessly. And I'm not sure people can see all the background that they do, all the things that they do. So I wanted to highlight it. And then I also wanted to highlight why I think it's not only an emergency, but critically important that uh, the, the Sheriff's Department be granted this position as soon as possible. So just this year alone, just in 2021, and, this, and keep in mind that we have a small community compared to Kent, Kalamazoo, and, and Wayne County and, and larger counties. We've had two homicides. In those two homicide cases, and people are innocent until proven guilty, but of those two homicide cases, both involve very young people, so there's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of 
young people involved in the witness in interviewing process there's a lot of investigation that goes on we've had to we've also had two missing persons that have been recovered one has not been identified yet but we those are undetermined cases so in order to decide whether or not those are homicides in enormous amount of man hours woman hours it has to go into the investigation of those cases to either prove or eliminate homicide as a manner of death we've also had some very violent domestic violence cases I had my office run the numbers and I'm going to tell you that from 2019 to 2020 there was not a major increase there was a small increase in the amount of cases that our office sees but what I want to emphasize to you is that what I see is what they eventually can bring to me but there's no description for the amount of hours that goes into their preparation of what they bring to me what's changed and what's causing the increase in the hours is that these cases have become extremely violent we have a couple cases I think uh, under Sheriff Sixberry touched on one that involves a, an alleged kidnapping uh, and that one involved a mother and a child strangulation one of them was a near homicide and I'm, I'm gonna I've told this to Sheriff Leaf and I'll say it now I am forever grateful to the Barry County Sheriff's Department to our detectives and to the to the deputies that worked I round the clock to save this lady's life now that case will come to light and when it does people will hear more facts about it but all I'm saying it was during fair week and I remember it well every single shift that came on was briefed on what was going on and these people were uh, this lady was in danger so the sheriff's department's deputies and detectives worked around the clock to make sure that this lady got out of the situation alive there are numerous criminal sexual conduct cases and I'm not sure people realize maybe that for a criminal sexual conduct case involving a child we use the Safe Harbor Children's Advocacy Center and both Detective Mackey and Detective Kimball are qualified to do those interviews and they also attend those interviews we do have an actual interviewer uh, that that conducts the interviews most of the time unless there's a need for someone else they have to attend those interviews it's in our protocol so they have time spent on those uh, the other thing is they they it, it doesn't matter if it's an adult or a child the detective still handles the criminal sexual conduct cases we've also had barricaded gunmen we had an incident in uh, Woodland just just in August and that took an enormous amount of time not only uh, with the sheriff's department but with other departments but it also entailed an officer involved shooting that officer involved shooting was something that's my responsibility to go over it and it was a tremendous amount of information that the sheriff's department provided that the state police provided that the uh, crisis teams that were out there provided to me and the Hastings City Police provided to me to be able to make a decision and clear that officer of those uh, in that event but we still have the case itself uh, mr. Riddle is still pending court on that in addition to that the there's been officer involved shoot another officer involved shooting they've had the the sheriff's department assists in and handles fatality cases a fatality case is where somebody dies and sometimes they're attended deaths and sometimes they're unattended deaths but if it's a young suicide or a possible homicide or a vehicular homicide and, and that can be a drunk driving causing death a drunk uh, a driving on a suspended license causing death a reckless driving causing death or a regular manslaughter um, the, that takes a lot of power as well to get through those cases those are not the homicides you necessarily read about in the paper because they're not an, what we call an open murder those are vehicular homicides that take just as much time in most instances but they're they're just not as high profile sometimes the other thing that is important is the share the, the, the amount of court time the amount of court preparation the amount of witnesses so if you get a homicide you're not just you're not just doing going to the autopsy or uh, uh, recording what the defendant said or something like that they have numerous witnesses and I, I want to highlight one specific case just to give you an idea yesterday detective Mackey and I spent the entire day yesterday as well as 
uh, Deputy Herb Sergeant Frazier and uh, Chief Underheil from the Nashville Police and some lay witnesses spent the entire day on the People versus Andrew LaFay case. In case anybody may not know that name of that case, Andrew LaFay is a case where uh, we allege that Andrew LaFay shot and killed a girl that he was dating, uh, Grace Brickley, and he proceeded, uh, well, evidence yesterday came out that he proceeded to beat her to death on, a, on video. So that case alone, we, we went to a preliminary hearing yesterday and we're very, very happy when it was bound over by uh, Judge Doherty. But in addition to being bound over, this is something I'm not sure I've even seen in my career yet, but Judge Doherty canceled his bond, which was good. That means he took away the bond, but also it started a time tolling for us of 90 days. That means in 90 days, Detective Mackey and I will be expected to be ready for court unless something changes with his bond. We are up for the challenge, but, I, but the amount of information and effort that goes into the preparation of a criminal case is enormous. I'm going to have to dedicate my time to it in order to be ready in two months, but I can't imagine what Detective Mackey's gonna have to do. Detective Mackey and I reviewed that video in, in preparation for our court hearings. The emotional toll that these cases can take and the running <coughs> around to, to interview witnesses, trying to sort out who's telling the truth and who isn't on these cases is emotionally taxing. And I don't think there's anybody in this career that can say that it doesn't affect them emotionally. I've been in this business 33 years and most of it's been spent all of it's been spent doing criminal cases on one way or the other, and it is emotionally taxing. So my concern and what I want to emphasize to you today is that because Detective Mackey and Detective Kimball are as good as they are and as proficient as they are, that's why we are doing okay and we are staying above water. But what I'm going to tell you is that is about to change in the sense that we, it gets to a point where if they can't get us the information as fast as we need it to keep up with court uh, deadlines, then now we have to go back to the court and say, well, we need this deadline and that deadline moved, which is fine. To some extent, you can get them moved. But in the last month, these detectives have not even had a chance to get on their computer, excuse me, and type before another case came up. In the, just in the last few weeks we've had, or in the last month or so, we've had three recovered deceased bodies that they've had to deal with. We've had officer-involved shootings. We've had um, the case with the kidnapping has now come up for court. I, I, there's, they can't get started on another one before another one comes up. The, the problem is that with the emotional taxing and just the sheer amount of hours these take, this is very, very taxing on the body and on the mind. And what I don't ever want to see for my office and, and for our law enforcement is burnout. We, Barry County is lucky to have some of the best law enforcement. I've worked in different counties. I prosecuted in Allegan. They're amazing as well. But I have worked with some of the best. Detective Mackey is one of the best detectives I have ever worked with. And she and I have tried three cases, well, two cases so far, two first degree homicides in the last couple of years. And because of her hard work, we were able to get convictions on those. And I, I don't wanna see burnout and I can see it coming, not, not because of them, but just because of the circumstances. And do I think a lot of it has to do with COVID? Sure, I do. Everybody's under stress about that. There's a lot of emotions around. There's a lot of different opinions about it. But the bottom line is, it doesn't matter whose opinion is what or whether a person has COVID or not, it's causing a lot of stress. And so it's causing some, in my opinion, it's causing some increase in the violence in some of our crimes, people's stress level. So my concern is if we only have two people doing work for, the statistics were just read, if these two people are the only two people that in that department that are doing the detective work for that kind of an increase in criminal cases. I think that burnout can happen. I also think what's gonna become critical is there's going to come a time, and I would say we're probably right there right now, where we have to give defense attorneys information 
that they are entitled to and we want to make sure they get it and they get it on time and it's it's only because detective Mackey and detective Kimball work as hard as they do that we're able to keep up so far but if things keep going the way they are and I see absolutely no change in that trend whatsoever in violent crime I don't see a change coming a, a positive change then I'm afraid they're gonna burn out so I can tell you from a prosecutor's perspective and I I've been here how many years now on and off over the last several decades I, I generally wouldn't come I generally it's it's generally not just I usually leave it to the department themselves and Dara and I have <coughs> talked about this detective Mackey and I under Sheriff Sixberry I've never intervened in a situation like this because I figure you know Dara can talk to his budget and so forth my concern is we have some of the best and I just want to keep it that way I want to keep things and I care I care about these guys I care about burnout I care about their well-being I care about my own prosecutors well-being and I always tell people take care of yourself because we're human beings and these cases have gotten ugly they've gotten ugly our most recent homicide and again innocent until proven guilty but it involves a 17 year old suspect or defendant and a 17 year old victim the Lafay case from yesterday is a 20, 21 year old suspect and an 18 year old victim and so those have their own set of emotional pressure so I'm asking you I, I think it's important I think we've gotten to a critical phase I think it's become an emergency and I'm asking you to consider what I've said about the other side the court side and so forth and and grant this request Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tech Sergeant, do you have anything to say? I think it's pretty well covered. I'm here mostly to answer questions for you okay. guys if you have something specific for how we do our job. Um, before we go into Commissioner's questions, please ensure your questions and remarks are reflective that individuals are innocent until proven guilty and know that our presenters may be unable to answer questions related to individual cases. So we'll, we'll start with um, Commissioner Smelker. Yes, uh, Detective Mackey, how long has there been two of you detectives on the force? I've been here 22 years almost, and it's always been two people downstairs in the Detective Bureau. In, and I say Detective Mackey, but I've talked to you about this before, but any of you can answer these. Is it just COVID this time of year, or has this progressively went up year after year since you've think, been? I think if you look at the numbers, you can see there's there's been a trend moving upwards in all of these crimes. This far, I only took the numbers back to 2009, um, but I think you can you can generally see that trend has increased over the years, um, and COVID certainly has played a part as you know. Ms. Uh, NACFOR Press said, but if you if you take the numbers back to 2009, you can see that the the, the <coughs> crimes that under Sheriff Redoff, murder, rape, robbery, homicide, arson, extortion, and obscenity complaints, those are the complaints that are mostly dedicated to the Detective Bureau. So the two detectives handle those. Uh, back in 2009, there was 63 of those, and over the years, you can see they they've gone up just just a little bit each year and it's it's been able to be handled this far we've been able to manage and maintain um, you, you can see in 2015 there was a dramatic increase up to there was a hundred complaints um, you know and as with all general trends do they they do fluctuate a little bit um, in 2019 there was 116 um, we had a dip in 2020 uh, mostly because people just weren't out and about as much I think but with that comes also it limited our ability so those 90 complaints that we still had to handle we were then limited in that even even be able to find people and do the investigation as as we see fit um, and this year alone like he said 122 complaints and we're only in October um, these numbers I think were run at the beginning of October they're they've increased since then so those numbers you can see that general trend has come has been moving to this critical point We've been able to manage up until now, and, and you know I've been in the Detective Bureau since 2013, 
and the detectives before us handled them just as well. But we're, we're at a tipping point now in 2021, like uh, Julie was saying, that it, it's become critical to do something. Can you give me any information? Go ahead. And, the, and she's just talking about the criminal side of those complaints that she, but there, she's also involved or they're also involved in the other 157. So really, the 179 complaints year to date, or 279 year complaints year to date that they had their hands in something uh, because of the drug overdoses, suicides they have to be involved in, as well as the missing and danger or runaways. If there is another detective put on, will that save some money in overtime? I think this would be Jason's question probably. <laughs> I would say yes, it would, due to the fact that it would be less than them for the, for the, de the detectives right now that have to continue to work over to get reports done or get things uh, ready for the prosecutors in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. So yes, it would save on overtime budget for that part. I'm done for right now, but I may ask some more after everybody else gets done. <laughs> um, Commissioner Getty, do you have any thoughts or questions? I, just an observation that um, that touches base on what the detective said is that um, that individuals and staff can can sort of um, acclimate to changes over time, and you can see that in these numbers. Um, but you do get to a tipping point. And, and I trust um, by having these four individuals here that we're at this tipping point that they wouldn't come here carelessly. Um, that, that public safety is important and it's important to um, have staff to be able to investigate these crimes. So I, I would support their, their request. Great. Commissioner Campbell. Um. I'd just like to say that um, I think we have a, a great um, sheriff department here. I think our, our safety and stuff has to always come first with our citizens. And along with our safety with our citizens, of course, we have the, the other side of the role is that it's going to cost us some money. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I never stand in the way of getting better safety for our citizens and security, and uh, that's what it all amounts to. Uh, I'd be a little wondering what would happen in the in the event that uh, this covid phase that we're in right now in life uh, does disappear and stuff if, if if our numbers do happen to go back down or something what would happen in that particular situation um, would we maintain using that person in any other aspect other than the detective work or in the event that it did take a downturn or something in the the crime end of it I think if COVID got better, and God willing, I hope that it does, I, I, if it gets better and continues to get better, I think what's kind of more important about these numbers that Detective Mackey and, and the Sheriff's Department has provided is that the increases have been before COVID, long before COVID. So that's when I say that I think the trend is going to continue. I, I, I think we were more heightened to it during COVID, but I think that the trend is going to continue because I'm looking at the numbers that predate COVID. Uh, I don't see it really taking any trend down anytime soon at all because uh, first of all, we got cell phones and computers and uh, I think everybody here will shake your head that those are a big problem. And uh, you start looking at those type of crimes, and uh, we're, we're talking about investigations. Part of the investigation is that they have to run back and forth to whatever lab will take the uh, evidence that we have, and then they have to go back and get the results from that lab. And you're talking of the Grand Rapids and Lansing, right? The two main labs we use? Right. Oh, Battle Creek. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, anyways, we're, there's a lot of drive time involved here. Uh, when we have a big case like this, uh, I don't know how many witnesses you guys have, but every one of those witnesses have to have subpoenas. And uh, all that is time consuming, hunting them down and giving them subpoenas because we deal with people, a lot of people who are homeless or jump from, from place to place. 
and trying to up, catch up to them. So there's a lot more to it than just these numbers here. And uh, I'll go down there and I'll ask them how they're doing. And uh, shoot, they're, they're sitting on 40 cases and some of them from last year. And and you have to be organized in order to do this job. I mean, you think about it, you got 40 cases, so you got time to work on this one. So you work on it so you can't work on it anymore. Then you got to put that one away, then you got to change gears to this case over here, and you have to be able to pull that out, work on that. I mean, 40, 40 at any given time that they're, they're down. And uh, <laughs> I kudos to my staff for being able to do that, because that's why I would never became a detective. I wasn't that, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? I just, I didn't have that ability. I could go out and handle a case and handle it well, but for me to go out and take on 40 cases, I don't think I could have handled that very well. So kudos to them for that. Commissioner Connor. Um, thank you. Um, on average, how many hours of overtime do your deputies work per pay period per month, something? Just on average. Are you asking about detectives or deputies? I'm sorry. Detectives. I'm sorry. Did I say deputies? Yeah. I'm sorry. Detectives. It's, do you want me to answer that? Yes. It's, it's really hard to say because it's really dependent on what's coming in. Um, I can tell you that in February when that homicide came in and we dedicated so many man hours right off the bat because evidence is lost, witnesses are gone, and, and you have to work on it when you can. Um, so, for example, just that one case alone, I think I probably had 30 to 40 hours that month alone and, and my partner would have been pretty close to that. So that that changes. So some months I, I'm able to um, not have any overtime given out only because you know we're at a stage in, in our caseload where it's we've got the critical stuff done, we've triaged what we can in that moment and so we're just typing. Now typing it sounds like it's not a lot, but we could. I could literally spend all day typing. I, yeah, I totally yeah. get that. It's more than we get typing. That. It's, yeah. it's from providing it's analysis on, on what happens. Yes, yes. yes. And, and it and does I, take a lot I, of energy. I, we literally could work all day, every day, and and not not ever go home. But we can't do that either. So we have to triage how we spend our time. So it, that's a hard to average out, but it, yeah. so it's case dependent. Um, second question. I got three questions. Okay. Um, how many, how, uh, okay, I, I, this is for you two, um, under Sheriff Sixbury and uh, Sheriff Leaf. With all the assignments that your deputies have or your staff have, however you want to say that, and kind of links to what John was asking about staff, um, how many officers or deputies are out there I don't know, patrolling, keeping us safe, <laughs> doing that type of thing instead of being assigned to a case or assigned to security or assigned to a court. How many are out there enforcing the law? Depends. I mean. Well, and when you're saying patrolling, that's not. Whatever. We do everything. You know, Take, obviously, we're, we're taking criminal complaints, we're taking non-criminal exactly. complaints. Exactly. Responding we're, to we're a complaint. Civil mm -hmm. disputes everything like that and trying to handle three courts or five courts that want deputies up here all the time which is another issue we'll talk about another day yep. I don't want those numbers right <laughs> uh, so um, anywhere from two to five people a day uh, depends on a shift oh a, a shift day. two okay. to five people a shift we have 12 hour shifts so we could have as little as two which is not good for safety reasons mm -hmm. but yeah. that's sometimes what happens and as many as five now that's not counting them work uh, the uh, division up in Middleville because they have their own, but they have one on almost well except for certain hours of the day they have someone on. Because I, I realize that the deputies that are in the court are also in enforcing the law and also the ones that are the detectives. All of those I understand that, but I just just for like I said answering a call taking or, calls out on the road. Yep. Uh, whether it's a phone call complaint or going to the house or that type of thing is two to five deputies on at a time. And how many people are on your staff? We have 30 sworn deputies. That's counting the sheriff, myself, as well as the uh, lieutenant of operations. Okay. All right. And was this not perceived a priority during the budget time? 
five months ago in May when we kind of got started mm -hmm. with budget requests? It's always been a priority. We've always been asking for a, a deputy. <laughs> Did you and, uh, request one this go round? Yes. We did, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. I don't think we've ever not asked for one. <laughs> I just couldn't remember. <laughs> I remember right. It was two this time, wasn't it? Two deputies? Probably, yeah. yeah. <laughs> two deputies. Right. Okay. But not two detectives? No. Well, a deputy, we're just going to, we can put him into that detective role. Oh, so okay. I, I've known for a while we've had this problem here. Okay, so no, didn't you? Yeah, okay. Because we've got a sergeant in charge of the detective bureau. Okay. Real quick, a hard other question about that is is losing and not having it. We can't send our de detective up to cover the courts either. So, mm -hmm. so our Absolutely. deputies itself have to do so many multiple, mm -hmm. multiple other issues, and that's why a lot of times they do as much as they can on these other complaints. Mm -hmm. But that's why our detectives also get involved in a lot of these more yeah. depth sometimes. Well, that's why I asked about if a detective had been requested and if I misspoke I'm sorry a detective had been requested during the budget it was not officially just for okay detectives. Oh, okay no. that's all right okay. at 576 square miles and driving around 327 plus lakes so yeah sometimes yeah, you only have two on. I've been on I've been on those ride alongs twice yeah. so <laughs> thank you Commissioner Commissioner Gibson uh, it looks like there's a lot going on in Berry County and I think you need another detective but I'd like to know uh, comparable size counties, do you know how many detectives they have on theirs, like uh, Ionia or Allegan, or just for a point of interest? I believe Ionia has two. Um, I believe Allegan, uh, last I talked to somebody over there, I think they had eight. Uh, Eaton County's multiple, Kent, it's innumerable, I think they have eight per section, so the family crimes have eight, the homicide has eight. Um, I think really hurt I haven't really dug into that I wish I would have before this um, <laughs> but get enough on your plate <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I'm trying to, what other, it, what it seems I, that um, I think we need to pause and, and reflect on the reality that the detective positions not a patrol officer right, no. right. and they respond or assist in delivering justice to the cases that have been brought forward by deputies and police across the county so it's really i think we need to pursue um, assume that the other counties have what they need to deliver justice you know mm -hmm. May I say something? yeah um when you detective mackey when you were talking overtime were you including comp time in that because i know our officers can build some decent comp time this the one specific case that i addressed that you know as, as an example that included both comp and pay um, okay. but as a general rule of thumb no i, I wouldn't say mm -hmm. that so, you, so you're saying for that month ot and comp combined was 30 to 40 hours yes Okay. But I, approximately I say, approximately I mean speaking just to myself on that case I don't know what detective Kimball did but I think I was maxed out in my comp already so I probably took most of it in pay to be okay. honest because on top of having this work to do getting the time off you have to schedule that right. as well so we're not able to burn our time as quickly as and, and sometimes I ask these questions because when you say it and people hear it they have a greater understanding sure. of the amount of hours. Yeah. So, when I, hold on just a second. Um, when I went on uh, right along with the deputy, he told me that they drive at 90% of their ability so they can respond to the unexpected. It sounds to me that we have a detective bureau that is driving at 100% of their capacity. Would that be fair? That would be a fair assumption okay. as of late, yes. Okay. Kimball lost some vacation time because he didn't use it, mm -hmm. and and uh, that's that's what she was referring to is that sometimes mm -hmm. they can't use their vacation or personal time. Mm -hmm. Great, John. Um, Dar, just for when it says uh, deputy parenthesis detective, you're going to add a detective. Chances are that, that detective will come out of your 
deputies and you're going to hire a deputy to replace that one is that am i oh yes close? <laughs> yes uh, we need somebody with some experience and somebody who's uh, coordinated and multitasker that's what i was trying to think of earlier somebody can multitask so yeah we're going to look for somebody from within and then hire one for uh to replace uh, them on the yeah yeah well, the law enforcement and then the next thing which doesn't have much to do with well it does have something to do with the de detectives how does that work is there a test or this isn't promoted because i like you right they've got to know the job and take a test for it or something am i, uh, or am I wrong I we were, did kimball take a test i don't remember for sergeants we have the test i, I don't remember if uh, deputy kimball took a test or not i believe during like when i uh, went through the process there was not a test uh, for t for detective um, but there was an interview process and that's based okay. upon the, the experience the seniority you have and your ability to a, be able to do this job versus you know regular law enforcement duties thank you I have no idea how the police department works I've sat across the table with you one time don't ever want to do it again <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Well, this is unique in that we usually take up position requests during the budget time, but criminals aren't ref respectful of our fiscal years. So we need to address this now or n never do it. If we're going to do it, we need to do it now. So with that, um, the question before the committee is to recommend to the Board of Commissioners approval to add a new full-time detective deputy position. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. Thank you. And yes. thank you for all you guys do. The Sheriff thank Office, you. appreciate your time thank and consideration. You. Thank you. <laughs> the next item from the Administration Office presented by Luell Del Dennison. At this time, the chair would entertain a motion to recommend to the Board of Commissioners approval of Budget Amendment 21D. So moved. Gibson. Support. That motion is made by Gibson, supported by Smelker. Discussion? Good morning, Michael. The well, has changed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who seconded that? Smelker. Thank you. Sorry, give me a second to make Did you have a good weekend, Michael? Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was. How about you? <laughs> it, uh, yeah, it, uh, it was a good one. So, um, so whoops, that's the deputy detective. So this is a uh, budget amendment, budget amendment 21-D. Um, we thought maybe this might be the one of the last of the year, but uh, we'll probably have another one uh, before the end of the year. This is a fairly comprehensive budget amendment. Um, it is presented in your typical format. A couple of the high points, it increases the general fund overall budget by about 170,000. Various revenue line items are adjusted um, due to uh, revised estimates. Of course, as we get toward the end of the year, um, our crystal ball gets a little bit clearer, if you may. So uh, we, uh, we are able to uh, dial in a little bit more closely. Um, one of the challenges we do as we get toward the end of the year, however, is uh, historically uh, 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 property taxes, which represent our single largest um, revenue for the general fund, were, were levied um, in December of the previous year, collected in that first quarter. So by uh, into the second quarter of the year, you had a really good idea of where your property tax revenue was at. Um, we don't have that uh, that case now. It's levied in the summer, so we don't uh, actually see it until the toward the end of the year. So uh, it's a big uh, big number, and even a, a small variance has a significant impact. But uh, uh, but we've worked at those over the year. To um, we f we still feel very confident in those. Um, <clears throat> I'll walk through real quickly if you'd like uh, the revenues. Um, the first page is uh, an, an overview of uh, both the expenditures and the uh, revenues by kind of source or category. Again, you'll see the second to the last column on the right is the amendment amount, 
and each of those increases by $170,396. Our <clears throat> final amendment, or based on this amendment, uh, our budget uh, will be $18,888,000 for the general fund. A couple of, uh, on page two, as we go through the actual revenue amendments, um, the single largest, I believe, in the general fund is uh, toward the bottom, 213,000 other federal grants. That is uh, revenue that we received, if you remember, in 2020, we participated in the public safety, public health, re payroll reimbursement program. Um, we actually did not take advantage, if you may, of the public health side because the health department being a uh, separate body applied directly for those funds. Uh, we did receive reimbursement. The reimbursement that we received um, in 2020 wasn't as much as what we had requested. Department of Treasury went through a process whereby um, they um, audited everybody and um, there were some funds left over f because of programs that had requested funds but did not receive them for a variety of reasons. So then they redistributed those. We received an additional $213,870. Um, while the health department did not participate in ours, they did it on their own. Central Dispatch was eligible for that, as well as Middleville's police program. Um, so in the expenditure side, you will see <clears throat> later on that there's an allocation of some of those funds to Central Dispatch, as well as then an allocation of some of those funds to Middleville. I'm going to jump all the way to page five, <clears throat> and uh, you'll see that the again the total increase is 170 396 170 thousand three hundred ninety six dollars. Be happy, real quick. I'll stop and answer any questions relating to revenue. Increases. Any questions? Let's continue. On the expenditure side, um, which are paid for the general fund pages six and seven, <clears throat> you'll see that uh, there are, uh, again, that second to the last column on the right, um, a variety of, of increases, changes. That's not true. A couple, uh, I guess, one decrease. The single largest increase, however, in the um, amended expenditures is to contingency totaling uh, $82,600. So contingency under this uh, amendment would go from 36,000 to 118,000. Those are unallocated funds that the board can use at their discretion. Um, and uh, so they are not committed at this point. Um, and if, if we, not that you have to use them, I'm not encouraging or suggesting that necessarily, just indicating that uh, that this budget amendment does result in an increase to contingency which means <clears throat> our revenue revenues anticipated revenues um, went up more than what our anticipated expenditures went up so it's a good thing again that uh, balances it at $170,396 does not anticipate an increase in fund balance, although when, when the year is finished and the audit is conducted, um, we historically have seen, if, if you recall, revenues come in um, pretty close to where we anticipated. Expenditures come in less than what we at anticipate due to department's fiscal responsibility. Uh, that results in then uh, a, uh, a surplus that we have historically transferred to um, vehicle data processing, um, building rehab, and capital. I anticipate that will be the case this year. Just don't know how much. Page eight is a bit of a detail relating to the um, expenditures. Um, you'll notice that the, the top half is kind of grayish. Um, and you'll notice there's a footnote that that was already entered. Um, those were either <coughs> amendments that were 
approved by the board previously as a single amendment or they were administrative amendments where funds didn't increase or change the changes didn't either increase the total budget for a department or they were all, they were transfers or changes within um, an activity and not between payroll and um, operating expenses so we pull that in so that uh, again it, it catches us up with a comprehensive amendment and then pages 9 through 11 um, provide changes to uh, special revenue funds that we have um, and then the final page page 12 gives that same detail for special revenue funds so I'll stop at that point and happily try to answer any questions that anybody might have this transfer from transfer into central dispatch for 32,000 do they hire another employee or is this overtime and that's the uh, uh, reimbursement from the public safety payroll reimbursement program okay so that original was it 200 and 31,000, 213,000 that I spoke mm -hmm. of in revenue that we got. Um, that's, that's a transfer that goes to them because um, the expenses that we submitted to the state to support the grant were payroll expenses for central dispatch during the COVID period that qualified um, for that program. So in theory or assuming they don't make any adjustments to their budget that just goes back into the general fund they'd have a thirty two thousand that, that money goes into their fund their fund I'm talking about their operation their opera correct right. they are a special revenue fund so we transfer it to them and then yes if, uh, if they don't spend it it will just become part of fund balance in in their fund yeah questions or comments Hearing none, the question before the committee is to recommend to the Board of Commissioners approval of Budget Amendment 21D. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. At this time, the would entertain a motion to recommend to the Board of Commissioners approval of the attached revised position description for payroll and human service specialist and to reassign the function of payroll and benefits administration from the county clerk's office to the county administration office. So moved. Support. That motion is made by Smelker, support by Gibson. Let's take a look at this, Michael. Sure, thank you. So, um, as I indicated in the agenda request form, uh, historically the function of payroll and benefits administration has been uh, performed um, by the first deputy clerk within the county clerk's office. It predates administration. my office my function came um, came later on so uh, but it has uh, uh, historically and that was typical of, of many counties um, in January of 2022 the, the current uh, payroll and benefits uh, first deputy clerk uh, will be retiring and we will miss her yeah. we know she's listening <laughs> so congratulations Karen Pam and I have uh, our county clerk and I have talked uh, about this and now uh, would be a good time to reassign that function to administration what we hope to gain in the process is that uh, uh, administration bargains all, all the bargaining agreements um, we negotiate and, and procure all the benefits um, work comp uh, disability life insurance health insurance um, and the like and to have that position uh, situated uh, as part of the administrative team so that they're more connected with regard to the benefits that are procured um, particularly as we uh, w we begin to to look toward uh, uh, benefits that are for example retirement where employees are uh, either more responsible for the benefit that they have it's not just blanket provided by um, the employer um, uh, or there's uh, additional uh, uh, 
co-pays or contributions that are required of employees uh, so that uh, we can be as accurate with the information that goes out as possible um, and, uh, and and now seems like a, a good time to to do that we've looked at uh, the need for a, a full-time human resources coordinator if you may that's been talked about by uh, Commissioner Connor for a few years now anyways maybe even a number of years um, and and this is a potential start to that process it, it gets us going we looked at trying to bring that function include, include pardon me include that function in this uh, position description and as we did the research just it just doesn't they, they don't necessarily complement each other a lot of what payroll does is task oriented I don't want to diminish the, the role simply to that but it's it, it, it's a very task oriented it's um, uh, it, it, and doing similar things over and over with a human resources coordinator um, that would take us into a step of assisting departments in the hiring process of recruiting of advising departments is benefits and um, compensation changes it, what is it that's that's attracting employees to come to work for Barry County and that's hugely important I'm not sure we've had as many positions um, available as I've seen in my career at one time and we have a number that are coming up I'm recruiting right now for equalization director and and, and it's a challenging market um, this is going to be a difficult position and there's some positions that we just can't afford to to go without equalization director for example if we don't have one we can't just say well we'll fill in we'll do our best we'll maybe not worry about that function right now without it we can't levy taxes I mean it just is critical to all of our 911 transit Charlton Park general fund as well as then all of your townships and villages um, payroll is the same way I mean, just can't go without a payroll person um, I just can't say well we so it's 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 we've been fortunate we've had a lot of history and longevity here um, we're starting to see those folks saying okay it's time to retire that happens um, so we we haven't let off on the need for a that human resources coordinator um, but as we try to find rep funding to pay for it it becomes a challenge um, this is a, a a spot to maybe start that and, and build that process so said a lot um, I'll stop for just a minute and try to answer any questions hope I'll open it up to questions or comments from commissioners I personally think this is a good move logical have anything John I agree with you <laughs> uh -oh. I, yes I thank you very much I'm I'm excited to uh, see this change so and uh, I think we'll bring Barry County more up to date I mean I think as Barry County continues to grow it's much needed so yeah. thank you very much it um, it aligns uh, the, the the, the county clerk, uh, particularly as the, it, with elections, um, it has a couple of functions, um, and, and payroll is, is not necessarily one of those functions that... Um, Just in the 80s, that's brought. where they put the responsibility. It, it was. I mean, there, exactly. that, I think that's why a, co a county administrator came along, is that the county clerk began to take on responsibilities that... Uh, that, that were uh, more than what that their expertise was and and we that's what we're trying to to maybe yeah. take this opportunity to change now as I talk about elections for a minute there is two things relating to to the cost we've uh, reviewed the job description we've changed that and those changes we don't feel change the the pay grade of this position we think they're complementary so we don't anticipate a change in uh, in pay grade or cost from that perspective however the the county clerk um, is losing some um, staffing relating to uh, 
um, clerking functions, I think primarily in the election side of things. But uh, as I indicated in here, there is a, a point at which the county clerk's gonna need to take a look at her staff and, and, and may have to come back and ask for a part-time position to help fill in and do some things. So I just wanna make sure that that's, I don't wanna leave Pam hanging that everybody expects that it's just e no, no additional cost and then she's forced to come back and say, oh hey, by the way, um, this needs, so we'll continue to monitor that and look at that. Further discussion or questions? Hearing on the question for the committee is to recommend to the Board of Commissioners approval of the attached revised position description for payroll and human service specialist and to reassign the function of payroll and benefits administration from the county clerk's office to the county administration office. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Limited public comment. This time, any member of the public wishing to address the committee may do so for up to three minutes. Once again, Gary White. An independent person at the health board said the board was done listening to Ibbotson. That was Lieutenant Scott Brooks. That should be food for thought for the board members that were there because he was pretty independent at that point in time. He did make a decision. Uh, new health, uh, medical health director. I read that in the paragraph that got me uh, much of what we do in infectious disease ties to public health seamlessly, uh, both currently and historically. Uh, Dr. Ketty, I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, said, this includes everything from administering immunizations to environmental monitoring for public health risks such as with a zoonotic infections. Uh, down there a little bit further at the very end, this is just part of it, not all of it, but it says that in learning with, uh, in the department and helping the local organization achieve its vision of creating community, it goes on. Uh, a few weeks ago I brought up the strategic plan that Toast is back in there. Now we got a new medical director in there. Are they gonna look at that and say, gee, we gotta get Toast back in here in Barry County. Have you addressed the part of Toast and the strategic plan for the health department? I think that's going to be actually huge if somebody comes in there. Do we really want Toast back in this community? I don't think so. But it's in your strategic plan. Has anybody addressed it on the health board of this county? I haven't heard nothing at this point in time. Uh, comp time. I heard about that talked about. If you review comp time, what you do for every comp hour, you lose one and a half hours of work so the more comp time you have to give out the worse you are off because then you're having somebody else fill that comp time with overtime which creates even more as a village president and having sat in on numerous police uh, chief hirings it's not uncommon that we would see bailiffs come in and apply for this if we are really putting deputies up in the court and not having them on the road or looking at things like that. I think reorganizing and restructuring some of the things that you do in this county are really important. I don't know why you'd want to have deputies up in the court system when they should really probably be out on the road or doing some type of investigation when you can put a bailiff probably at a lesser rate because most of these people were part-time. Uh, boy, so I, when I just hear what's going on, I'm just not seeing a lot of ideas coming that really need to be start to be looked at uh, court maybe hires their own bailiffs and takes that on their budget and doesn't come out of the sheriff's department budget I just see a lot of things that could be really looked at and changed so thank you is there further public comment <laughs> all right I'm Adam Heikola and before I start reading this, I'd like to just say that uh, soft judges make hardened criminals. And the same thing with, with uh, morally bankrupt officials. We're going to have a morally bankrupt community. And so 
what we see here is that there are some morally bankrupt individuals that have been in leadership positions in this community. And so the increase of crime, violent crime, all of it should not be a shock. And why this lesser magistrate doctrine is that much more important for all of you to know. So I'll continue reading here. The lesser magistrate doctrine had a huge impact upon the thinking of our founders and upon the nation's people regarding government and law. We, however, live in the midst of a status slave-like people where, we, where such thinking has long been forgotten. The magistrates themselves know nothing of this doctrine today because the pulpits have been silent regarding it. If ever this nation needs to understand the lesser magistrate doctrine, it is now. Immoral and unjust edicts are commonplace. The pre-born are being murdered and sodomy is being proliferated. The assault upon our freedom and liberties is a daily undertaking by those in high office. The attacks upon the law of God are ferocious and relentless. In our nation today, the state has declared good to be evil and evil to be good. The lesser magistrate has a duty before God to uphold the, the good regardless of the new definitions created by the state. We must remember that all authority is delegated. No man who holds the state office rules autonomously. The authority he has is delegated to him by God. Hence, all those in positions of authority stand accountable to God. This is why the practice of the church historically has been when the state commands that which God forbids or forbids that which God commands, we have a duty to obey God rather than man. The Bible clearly teaches this principle. The lesser magistrate is to apply this principle to his office as magistrate. When an unjust edict is made by a higher authority, the lesser magistrate must choose to either join the higher magistrate in his rebellion against God or stand with God in opposition to the unjust edict. As our nation sinks more and more into rebellion and depravity, the lesser magistrate doctrine needs to be taught more than ever. May the Lord grant us the strength and favor to do so. Thank you for your comments. Is there further public comment? Ted DeVries, uh, Prairieville Township trustee, and I want to thank Vivian for pushing on having the county commissioners look at the ARP money applications, which um, the township asked me to um, kind of represent them. Um, this is an email that I got from Craig Jenkins, who was unable to be here today. Hi, um, actually I sent this, hi Craig, I'm working on the application on behalf of the board and after talking with Jim Dahl, we believe we should ask for assistance with the sewer drain infrastructure for the Watson Drain District. Prairieville Township's portion is $799,049.27. This money will be coming directly out of our general fund. The Township Board feels we should ask for the same amount that the Township is receiving from the federal government, which is $368,000. Do you feel this is something the commission would approve? Thank you for your help with this. And the response I got back from Craig, yes, I think if you were to frame it as the township is using their current 368,000 as matching, that would be taken more seriously and show that the township isn't trying to get ahead by not using their funds at all. This is what we recommend to Barry Township regarding the water tower as well for them to show some substantial matching and effort to get the county to recognize the significance of the need. The county board definitely wants to be able to show that they've used the funds for actual needs and not just wants. And I would say this is a need for sure. Um, when I, you, you will all be seeing our budget and probably our, our notice. Let me just read you the executive summary if I have a second that I wrote for this. Um, the Watson Drain District has been a serious health issue for a part of our Prairieville Township residents. People have had to leave their homes as there was flooding and inadequate drainage. The project is scheduled to be 90% completed by April 1st, 2022. The Township received an assessment of $799,049.27 to pay for their portion of the Watson Drain District. This doesn't even include all the residents that are in Prairieville Township that are in this district. They also have an assessment they'll be paying. 
some as high as um, $8,500. Um, this substantial, uh, you know, we were expecting an assessment, but not as large as this is. The substantial amount is almost two years of our total township expenditures. We do have the option to spread this amount over 20 years. If we choose to do that, the annual cost would be over $55,000. To pay this, current services would have to be cut for all people, and any additional services could not be added. All right, that's three minutes. Can you summarize your remarks? Sure. By receiving this money, the key outcome goal is to address emergency medical services for the entire township. Um, it's critical that hopefully the, the county commission looks at you know these uh, you know ours I noticed we were we were scored at the very bot I mean the the last one as far as getting money on this so we hope that uh, by you looking at you maybe will help Prable Township out thank you Ted thank you is there further public comment Larry Baskerel the township uh, we seem to be picking and choosing sometimes these troubled times the uh, Supreme Court rulings we like uh, and the ones we don't as an example we don't like uh, Jacobson versus Massachusetts because that ruling gave the state uh, the right to mandate vaccinations okay a lot of us don't like that however we do like the uh, oh shoot uh, New York Times uh, versus uh, true whatever I've got it written down here someplace because that gave the public the right to criticize public officials okay some clarification too there seems to be a lot of confusion in the audience lately about uh, how the first what the first amendment impact is on a public body meeting the uh, there was no absolute right to speak at a public meeting as the United States Supreme Court put it the Constitution does not grant to members of the public generally a right to be heard by public bodies during decisions of policy. That ruling was Minnesota State Board for Community Colleges versus Knight around 1984. Uh, what actually gives us the right to speak at a public meeting is the Open Meetings Act. Okay, there's been also some confusion on uh, whether the board can uh, uh, prop, uh, put rules in effect as far as the uh, somewhat of the content and the length of speaking that we that I can have during this meeting and uh, if you look at uh, Attorney General's opinion uh, 5332 it specifies that you can put rules in place that specify times and what have you that you can speak also gives you the ability to uh, exclude somebody from the meeting for a breach of peace if you have the fortitude to do that and be remember there's a number of different uh, variations of breach of the peace the Barry County Board of Commissioners has such a rule in their in their uh, rules and regulations they have and it uh, it's uh, on the agenda lim limited public comments states three minutes per person uh, portion I section 4 also states public comments three minutes per person per individual and uh, if the, they can speak longer if the chair extends extra time okay and I'm, I'm frankly I'm getting a little tired of people standing up here and saying it's a violation of the First Amendment and what have you I would highly recommend you read this a portion of this to uh, before public comments in the next couple of sessions and maybe that'll get some clarity going on here because frankly uh, what's been happening lately from my perspective uh, folks uh, failing to yield the podium has been kind of embarrassing to me so thank you very much thank you is there further public comment Oops. Sharon Olson again Irving Township I regarding the water tower situations being really high on the list of those funds to be distributed um, I've raised three kids that are have different occupations one of them is an environmental engineer so I discussed this with her and asked her what her thoughts were on it because our board has also been approached to provide matching funds for one of those towers 
um, she told me that in her work in that area with other townships that she did during her internships, that they are required to have in their billing the replacement costs figured into that. So they should have all this time. And that there's a date, start date of that law. And I would challenge your board to look at Eagle to somebody to find out what their obligation has been to this point that's not been met when you review those requests. That's what we intend to do as a board because I don't even know if legally we can do that. If legally we can take funds that were intended for our township people and switch them to a, what do they call them, non, can't remember the term anyway. They, they're getting their own funds. The village is getting their own funds. So they've already been allocated ARPA funds. The rest of the township has been allocated ARPA funds. So can we even legally take that and shift it over to their request? Does that make sense? I, my concern was doing the right thing for the people that those funds are intended to, to go to and have the people that have those infrastructures been doing their due diligence and planning ahead and having those funds part of their billing process, if indeed that was required by law in the 70s or 80s. So that was one of the concerns that I had regarding what I was reading today. Thank you. Is there further public comment? Hello, Charles Herzler, Hastings City. Uh, about this ARPA thing here, where I was looking at the sheet and stuff, I pulled it off the agenda packet. Listen, I did have some questions I would like to have asked today, but I don't know if I have a proper time or place to do that, you know, during the meeting itself when you had ARPA people here. So I am hoping that you do have open meetings like you did with the jail, where people can get together and sit and talk with these people and get a better understanding of how they came up with this scoring list how they come up with how much money everybody's going to get and stuff. More public involvement. All right, so I can ask, because I'm not a smart guy. I don't know all this stuff and everything. I'd like to understand it better. Because there's a lot of numbers here reflecting a lot of money. How do you go from a score of zero to up to 356, how they score this? I would like to have a better understanding of that, and I'd like to ask the people who's doing that, how do you come up with this? And have explain it in terms that I can understand. So I really do hope that when you have these meetings, they are open to the public. And public gets to be able to ask the questions like they did with the jail. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Is there further public comment? Hearing none, if there's no objection, the committee will now adjourn. Without objection, the committee is now adjourned.